Good morning, Karis Bible College. Praise God. We also like to thank those that are watching online and and live stream, so good to have you today. We have a special treat. Today we have Pastors Happy and Jeannie Caldwell in the house. And so Pastor Happy and Jenny, uh, Jeannie uh, founded and, and was the pastor of Agape Church in Little Rock, Arkansas for over 30 years. They're also, he's also the founder and president of Victory Television Network, carried over 200 cable systems around the world. And so uh, Happy Caldwell just travels around ministering the Word of God. He's a general in the faith. He's a father in the body of Christ. And, uh, and, so, and also he's been married to, to Miss Jeannie for... 50, coming down 50 years. Praise God. So give a warm Karis Bible College welcome to Pastor Happy and Jeannie Caldwell. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, so Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> How many of y'all are here today? Good. We're glad you're here. Uh, We have a short time this morning, but I'm so blessed and so honored to be able to minister to you. First and second year students, is that correct? Okay. And uh, I've asked my wife to come and minister in song right now. Uh, She's going to sing a very powerful up-tempo song called Fire. And um, maybe if you're not totally awake, you will be by the time she's through. And so she's going to come down and minister this to you, and then I'm going to share the word with you. Uh, this song was written uh, by Perry Stone. If you've ever heard or know of Perry Stone, he's an evangelist out of Cleveland, Tennessee, and uh, it's full of fire. Okay, hit it, maestro. Had arrived an upper room party, they would drop on the new wine. Peter stood among them, he knew there was no doubt. This Holy Ghost fire would make you want to shout. Fire, shut up in my bones. Holy Ghost fire, shut up in my bones. Just just like fire, shut up in my bones. Holy Ghost. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you would like to have a copy of her CDs, you can go online at our website, vtntv.com. It's Victory Television Network, vtntv.com. And uh, you can uh, purchase the CDs and uh, go to the books or shop or whatever online and get a copy. There's a, a lot of powerful songs, anointed songs. And uh, people have been healed listening to her music. Uh, there was one lady in our church years ago that was healed of blindness while she was singing. So there's power uh, in, with the anointing. Amen? Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 11. And I'm going to read from verse 3. In the Apostle Paul's second epistle to Timothy, chapter 3, he said, Also know that in the last days perilous times will come. We're in those days now. We're in the last days of the church age, the last days of the age of grace. And Paul was warning Timothy. He goes on to list all the things that you could expect uh, from depraved humanity. He said, in the last days, there's not going to be natural affection. There's going to be pride. People will be lovers of themselves. There will be terroristic threatenings. In Matthew 24, Jesus said that all these things, and he lists them, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, and we'll read that in a minute. He says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Now that can be alarming if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know what the Bible says. I was reading a story the other day about a woman who was interviewed concerning how she responded with her two children to the demonic false narrative of transgender. She said, well, I go into the bedroom every morning and wake up my little boy, my little girl, and I say to my little boy, honey, how do you feel today? Do you feel like a boy or do you feel like a girl? She does the same thing to her daughter. And if the little boy says, well, mom, today I feel like a little girl, she said, well, then that's the way I treat him all day long. Now you might say, what, what is that? That's demonic? That's ignorance? People today need to know the truth. I don't know if you ever, and I'm not picking on this particular topic, but I don't know if you've ever read Bruce Jenner's testimony. You know who Bruce Jenner is or was? He said that when he was a child, a voice spoke to him and told him he was a girl. And he said, so ever since that time, I have always wanted to be a girl, but I suppressed it and hid it because he was a, an athlete. But he said, as I got older, he said, that's why I always wore my hair long. I came out of the closet and I decided to go with what had been in me all these years. Now, where do you suppose that voice came from? Demon spirits. The entrance is through the mind. That's the battleground. People believe the wrong things. They're taught the wrong things. We see this now in our government. We see this in our culture. And I don't know whether it bothers you or not, but it sure bothers me. You know, in Arkansas, the last big mistake that the state made and in Colorado, they've already made these mistakes. And I told them, I said, y'all need to deal with this up here because it comes down the river to Arkansas. <laughs> we legalized medical marijuana. There's no such thing as medical marijuana. We had law enforcement and medical people from Colorado come to Arkansas and say, don't do this. It's destroying our state and our people. They voted in casinos. Legalized gambling, lotteries. Why do people vote for these things? Because they're lied to. They're told it's going to improve the economy. It's going to produce jobs. My brother and sister, if you don't know it, the mob is still very well alive and operating in our culture today. 
Why do all these things happen? And what are we, the righteous, going to do about it? Because it's our responsibility. Now, this might be heavy for some of you, but you're, you're seated in a nice seat. You can lift your feet off the floor because I might step on your toes. But nevertheless, this is part of the assignment God's given me in these last days. Read with me Psalm 11.3. Let's read it out loud. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? How many of you know you're righteous? You've been made right with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's not your righteousness. It's his righteousness. He made you right with God through your faith in Christ Jesus. But notice it says, if the foundations be destroyed. If you look that word foundations up, it refers to moral, political, and economic foundations. Well, we're seeing these foundations destroyed before our very eyes. The wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the hurricanes. I saw, when I saw the devastation in the Bahamas, I, I just wept. I cried for those people. They have nothing. We recently had a flood in Arkansas and it flooded acres and acres of farmland, destroyed homes. We were able to help some of the people replace their furniture and their appliances. Went out to visit this one lady right on the river. The river just came and washed her house away. These people are, are destitute. They have nothing. They're living in a camper. This was not an act of God. There was an article in a local magazine. The reason for the flood in Arkansas was not because of rain. It was because the Corps of Engineers in Oklahoma diverted the water to keep from flooding Tulsa. They opened the floodgates and sent it down the Arkansas River and flooded Arkansas. Who makes those kind of decisions? There are people that are making certain decisions that affect every one of us every day. I read a book years ago. Uh, what attracted me to it was the title. It said, How to Kill 11 Million People. And I thought, that's very interesting. I want to get this book. I want to read it. It's referring to the Holocaust. It refers to all the Jews, the gypsies, the political, everybody that was annihilated and destroyed during the Holocaust. And when you open the cover, how to kill 11 million people, the answer to the question, you lie to them. You lie to them. The Jews were told that they were going to be transported to a new land, have new houses, new schools, new jobs. For the, uh, they were lied to. They got on the cattle cars. Where'd they wind up? Concentration camps. <laughs> People of Arkansas were lied to and said, if we vote lotteries in, then, you know, it's going to fund tuition for college students. Well, we've had time to evaluate those lies. Only 18% of the money produced by the lotteries goes to tuition for college students. Casinos, it's going to be the same way. Medical marijuana, they've already had problems. So what's the matter with the American people? Are they stupid? Yeah, they are. Because they believe the wrong thing. They've been lied to. You say, well, how can we fix this? How can we correct that? I, I, I'm glad you asked because it says, if the foundations, moral, political, and economic, are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Didn't say, what can the government do? I have a dear friend that serves in the Arkansas State Senate. I have him on my TV program quite often. We were talking about this the other day. And I told him, I said, Senator, what, what, is, what is the matter with the people of Arkansas that they vote for these things? Medical marijuana, casinos, lotteries. What's the matter with them? Don't they know they can change this? And he said, Pastor, 50% of all registered voters did not vote. Now you can take that out of our state and you can apply it to the whole United States. People don't vote. 
Why? They're ignorant of the legislation. They don't want to bother with it. And I lay the blame of the ignorance of the people at the pulpit in our churches. It's the pastor's fault. You can quote me on that if you want to. Most of our viewers, when we teach every day, we have a daily program, a weekly program, and you can get it here. It's on, B, it's on uh, Andrew Womack's uh, Gospel Truth uh, Network. Most of the people tell me, Pastor, we thank you so much for teaching on these issues and making us aware of what's going on and uh, the objectives and, and dissecting the narrative so we can know the truth. We've gone to our pastors and asked them to address this and they won't do it. Why? They're afraid. They're ignorant. They don't think Christians should be involved in politics. The Bible teaches just the opposite. The Bible teaches that we should go into every man's world. The Bible says we should go to the whole world and preach the gospel to every preacher. Let me tell you, um, I look at a lot of prophecy teachers and, and I'm studying it and teaching on it more and more all the time. And I have people say, well, Pastor Caldwell, is America mentioned in the Bible? No. There are those that have speculated. There are those that um, have tried to make us feel good about America and where we're headed, and, you know, but it's not in the Bible. And there are those who say, oh, well, America's uh, one of the young lions, talks about the young lions. Australia, New Zealand, America, we're the young lions, the new nations, not the old world, not Europe, just the new nation. But you can't support that by scripture. One friend of mine who's written many books on prophecy and the second coming, uh, he wrote an essay on the apocalypse and apostasy and so forth. And he says, there is a comparison in the Bible that America fits, you won't like it, but it's comparable to Babylon. And Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man will be as it were in the days of Noah. And go over to Genesis and read what was going on in Noah's day. It said, it so grieved God in his heart that he repented that he'd even created man. They were killing babies. Yeah. And we've had presidents that have opened the doors for all these demon spirits to come in. President Clinton opened the door to abortion in 1973, made it the law of the land. President Obama opened the door to homosexuality. He opened the door to those demon spirits to come in and made homosexuality the law of the land. 1963, they took prayer out of school. When I went to school, in our homeroom class, every day we prayed. The teacher led the prayer and we read out of the Bible. Hello. And that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. If the righteous would have stood up and come against all of this, be a different country today. Now, you're here in Bible school, supposedly, to learn the Word of God. Well, what are you going to do with it when you get done? And I'm going to tell you at the end of the session today some things that you can do. Uh, let's go over to Matthew and read chapter 24. This is concerning the second coming of Christ. And let's look at verse 6, Matthew 24, 6. You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars, See that you be not troubled. This is our responsibility. We have to see to it that we're not troubled. I don't watch the national news. I turn it off. You know, they say that they're just mirroring the culture, but they're not. And, you know, we have one local affiliate there in, in Little Rock that there is a campaign called Victory Over Violence. And they're going to the neighborhoods where the gangs are. And they're having community suppers and weenie roasts and hamburgers and trying to develop a dialogue with the gangs to stop the violence. 
But yet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, those same stations run violence and filth all day and all night. You can't have it both ways. House divided against itself will fall. You can't shout victory over violence and then the other hand you s saturate the, uh, the culture with violence. That's what people see every day on television and social media. So what's going to be done? Well, we raised up three Christian television stations in our state and we preach the gospel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's literally changing the spiritual atmosphere. I read in the paper after the medical marijuana permits were issued to those that grow it and those that uh, sell it. I guess they had to do this by law. And one of the persons that was listed that invested in medical marijuana was an anchor on one of the local affiliate stations. And she primarily heads up the Victory Over Violence campaign. So with one hand, she's saying Victory Over Violence. With the other hand, she's making money off of marijuana. Are you all here? So what are we going to do about that? Jesus said, don't be troubled. Don't fear. Don't be anxious. But we're supposed to be involved. He goes on to say, see that you not be troubled. All these things must come to pass. Say that out loud. Must come to pass. So these things are going to continue. He said, but the end is not yet. When the Playboy Channel wanted to come on our cable system in Arkansas, our whole church went down to the city board. And we stood up and we said, no, we don't want the Playboy Channel on this cable system. And I knew one of the attorneys that worked for a law firm that was working with the Playboy Channel in the city board. Actually, he was on the city board. And he said, why do you all object to this? I said, have you ever seen the Playboy Channel? He said, well, as a matter of fact, a representative from the Playboy Channel came down to present to us what they were going to be showing on their network. I said, what did they show you? He said, it was a documentary on Mother Teresa. <laughs> I said, and you believed them. We protested. We stood up against it. Pastors are afraid to do this because they're afraid it'll jeopardize their 501c3. Well, President Trump has already taken care of that. He suspended that. So you don't have to be afraid. Anybody is perfectly legal. It's perfectly fine for you to teach the word of God. The knowledge of the truth makes people free. Okay, since you're so excited about it, let me tell you two things that America can do to survive. Number one, in Matthew 24, 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations and then shall the end come. So the number one thing America has to do is preach the gospel to the nation. I had the privilege of being on the steering committee when Billy Graham came to Little Rock in 1988, we had some of the pre-crusade events in our church. And one night we had in the back room, we had George Beverly Shea, Cliff Barris, and we were sitting there just listening to them talk. Two guys that had been with Billy since he started in the 50s. It was so refreshing. George was almost 100 years old uh, then. And he said that uh, one time uh, they got a, a letter from somebody that was critical of the song that they sang at the end of every Billy Graham crusade meeting. They said that what, what's drawing those people to the front is that song, Just As I Am. And he said, if you will quit singing that song, not nearly as many people will come down uh, to profess Christ. So they told Billy that. And Billy said, okay, just try that out for the next few crusades, two or three crusades. We won't sing the song. 
Billy just, you know, he always stood there in the pulpit and he said, give the altar call. And he said, come and I will pray for you. And he would pray and people would come. They didn't sing the song. Uh, for the next three crusades, they had three times as many people saved. <laughs> so it wasn't the song. What was it? Go over to Romans chapter one. Eh, this is so powerful. Romans chapter one, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel carries its own power. If you read Habakkuk and he talks about vision, vision carries its own power, as long as it's God's vision. Now, if it's your vision, you know, he's not obligated to anoint it. But if it's his vision, it carries its own power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So as long as we preach the gospel, we're going to have the power. Now, that's the first thing America has to do is to keep preaching the gospel. Billy Graham was America's pastor. Billy Graham's in heaven today. And there is no one that is going to, quote, take his place. The church company is responsible for taking ownership of our assignment. If you don't own it, if you don't take ownership of it, it won't get done. And when you get before Jesus the, at the judgment seat of Christ, instead of him looking at you and saying, well done, he'll look at you and say, well, what did you do? How did you serve? what did you do in the body? How did you serve your community? how did you serve your nation, your city? What did you do? to bring the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. So the first thing America has to do is preach the gospel. The second thing that will save America, and I've been involved in this for 14 years now with Pastor John Hagee, Christians United for Israel. He called 400 of us 14 years ago to join him in San Antonio and share the vision of Christians United for Israel. Genesis 12, three, standing with Israel. And in 14 years, we went from 400 to 7.1 million members. Every year we go to Washington, D.C. in the summer, July. We go to Capitol Hill. We visit all the senators, representatives from all 50 states. I'm not only a regional director or board of directors, but congressional liaison. The last year they invited us to the White House. The year before they invited us to the White House, the East Wing, the West Wing. We talked with Jason Greenblatt, Jared Kushner. They're working on the Israel-Palestinian peace plan. And they have, President Trump has five sets of eyes that look at all foreign policy relating to Israel. He does nothing unless it's approved by all five eyes, which is Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, Jason Greenblatt, his attorney. And they added CUFI to that list now. And they, want, they want CUFI to pass on all the legislation that affects Israel. Last year, we were invited to be a part of the dedication ceremony of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. It was a, it was a historic event. We went to the prime minister's office, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Israel is now acknowledging and looking to CUFI before they make national decisions because they see the body of Christ in America, Christians united for Israel as their friend. We are the friend of Israel. That's number two. If America will stand with Israel, Genesis 12, 3, we'll be blessed. The Bible says that. You curse Israel, you get cursed. You bless Israel, you get blessed. We had some IDF soldiers, Israeli Defense Force soldiers at one of our conferences in D.C. a couple of years ago. Precious young men and women. They serve on the line every day. We've been in the Golan Heights. We've been on the Gaza Strip. And Jeannie went up and asked one of the officers who was a, a woman. 
This is the first time they'd ever seen CUFI in operation. 6,000 people in the convention center. And she went up and she said, is this the first time you've been to America and experienced a CUFI conference? They said, yes. So well, I'd like to know how you feel about it. What did you experience? Can you tell me if there's one thing that stood out or ministered to you? And this one lady, Colonel, whatever she, her rank was, she said, yes, I can tell you. What is it? She said, the love. <laughs> They've never experienced the love before. My brothers and sisters, the church has not replaced Israel. That replacement theology is not biblical. Israel has its future. The church has its future. If we will preach the gospel to the world, and if we will stand with Israel, America will stand. If we don't, then America could fall just like every other nation that is a heathen nation or that has touched Israel. We, we did five world leadership conferences with Dr. Lester Summerall in Jerusalem. And uh, he wrote a book about the empires that have died and blown away in the wind because they touched Israel. And he quotes one Arab mayor who said, Jerusalem is like a bowl of vipers. If you stick your hand in the bowl, you die. The Bible says that Israel, the Jews, are God's chosen people. He chose them. The difference between them and us is we chose God, but God chose them. He honors both. Romans 11 says all Israel will be saved. We're actually like, you know, running interference on a football team. The quarterback is the quarterback. I mean, he's gifted, talented, anointed, however you want to describe him. But he, he's, he's limited if he doesn't have a strong defense. He's got to have people that run interference. That's who we are. We're the righteous. We can stop our nation's foundations from being destroyed. Let me read you some samples out of a, a book called The Art of War. Uh, it's written by Sun Tzu, S-U-N-T-Z-U. He was a Chinese military strategist. I read the book because I was invited to the U.S. Army War College to attend a strategic leadership conference. They didn't know I was a pastor. I, I was invited because I was a CEO of a television network. And we had to read two books, The Art of War and Killer Angels. Uh, we walked the battlefield of Gettysburg. It's still the way it was in the 1860s. Then we were taught uh, military strategy in the war rooms by the colonels and the majors. Very interesting. Paul told Timothy, I told the church at Ephesus, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in heavenly places. People are not our enemy, but people are possessed with demons. Uh, listen to these statements. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And I served six years in the Navy, board two, uh, two years at sea on two Navy warships, and I, I was trained to fight. I served down in Guantanamo Bay in the early 60s. We were shelling the islands. The Marines were dug in. We were in our gun mounts. We were at wartime alert. General quarters, our, our battle stations. And, you know, we had training, but training is good and necessary, but <laughs> you don't really know what it's all about until the bullets start flying. George Patton. Trained the third army to fire their rifles while they're running. They could cover one mile in 20 minutes firing their rifles. He taught them not to dig a foxhole. When you dig a foxhole, you dig your grave. The enemy knows where you are. So they kept moving and firing. The enemy didn't know where they were. The church has been sitting down, doing nothing. It's time to step out, step up, and step into God's glory. 
It's time for us to do something. <laughs> in fact, we were such good shots with our five inch 38 gun mount that some of the Marines that were dug in over there sent us some real nasty communication. <laughs> Said we were getting too close. Friendly fire. We don't fight flesh and blood. We fight the fight of faith. And Jesus has already defeated our enemy. He's a defeated foe. What are we doing? We're demonstrating his defeat. All warfare is based on deception. You have to deceive people into believing the wrong thing. If they believe wrong, they think wrong, they believe wrong, they talk wrong, they act wrong. All warfare is based on deception. Here's, a, here's one that I like. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. George Patton studied his enemy. His chief rival was Rommel. He read Rommel's book. He said, Rommel, I got you. I know what you're going to do because I've read your book. You got to know your enemy. Study the Bible. The Bible tells you who Satan is, what he can do and what he can't do. What he's about, what he is and what he's not. You know the enemy and you know yourself. You don't need to fear the results of a hundred battles. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Paul said, I fought a good fight. What was he talking about? The fight of faith. He simply acted on what Jesus did for us. You've heard Andrew say it lots of times. Grace is what God's already done. Your faith is how you access the grace. I like to describe it this way. The legal side of redemption is what God's already done in Christ. The vital side is what you do with what God's already done. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. You don't have to fight the devil. He's already been conquered. And you are more than a conqueror. You know what that is? R.W. Schembach described it this way. Heavyweight champion of the world. He fights the fight. He defeats the, the, the challenger. He wins the prize. They give him the belt and they give him the check. He goes home. His wife greets him at the door. He's got the belt. She takes the check. He's the conqueror. She's more than a conqueror. <laughs> Why? She didn't have to fight the fight, but she got the prize. Paul said, I press for the mark. I press for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Satan's already been defeated. He'd already, he's already been conquered. So if you uh, are looking at supreme excellence, supreme excellence is not fighting. Supreme excellence is resisting the enemy without fighting. Know your enemy, know yourself, and you can fight a hundred battles without disaster. When I was a kid coming home from school every day, it was a big old bully that followed me home and he'd whip up on me. He was bigger than me, older than me. And my father got tired of that. I got tired of it too, but I didn't know what to do with it. My daddy said, son, let me show you how, to, how you take care of this bully. Bullies are people that pick on people smaller, whatever. He went in the garage and he cut the handle off of a broom, handed me the handle. He said, here, you put this in the hedge out front of the house. And when the guy follows you home from school, you go up to the hedge and you get your hand on that broom handle and you tell him, if he don't leave you alone, you're going to knock his block off. So he did, and I did. I took that handle out and whacked him upside the head. And he went off running down the street crying to mama. Now, I'm not adv <laughs> advocating that because we don't fight against flesh and blood. <laughs> but I did then, and he never bothered me again. That's the way the devil is. If you'll stand up to him, Paul said, when you've done all to stand, stand. Okay. 
You know the enemy and you know yourself. You don't need to fear the results of 100 battles. Here's a good one. I learned this at the War College. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. But tactics without strategy is nothing but noise before the battle. Strategy is, I, I used to think wrong of strategy. I thought strategy was how do you get from point A to point B? That's not strategy, that's tactics. In the Navy, when we were maneuvering and, and we were playing war games before we actually got into war down in Guantanamo Bay, we would, we would uh, maneuver the, the ship to avoid being hit by a torpedo, zigzagging. Tactic is what you do to accomplish strategy. The strategy of the South in Gettysburg was to win the Battle of Gettysburg and then go on and take Washington, D.C. The problem was the South did not know that the North had refortified, changed commanders, uh, rearmed. They were up on Cemetery Ridge. If you've ever been to the battlefield, the, the Confederates started at the wood line the forest line, and they just went abreast, almost arm to arm, across that open field. It's still that way today. And the, and the Union just shot them down. Cannonballs, you take, in the, in the buddy system, you take out one soldier and two of them carry him to the wood line. So you're taking three people out of the line. If you just hit one, you, you remove three. They send out scouts. They didn't have communication like we have. And a scout would go out and try to find out what the enemy's doing, where they were. But a scout may stop at a tavern and be drunk for three days before he gets back. Gives the commanding officer the information. By that time, it's old information. Well, the Confederates lost the Battle of Gettysburg and they lost the war. Their strategy was good, but their tactics failed. Well, when you're dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and let me just say this about the things that I mentioned earlier. Gambling, prostitution, abortion, drugs, all those things are under the authority of rulers of darkness. Prostitution is a ruler, an area of darkness. Pornography is an area of darkness. Gambling is an area of dark, darkness. And you have demon spirits that are ruling over this. So the, the first thing that you have to start doing <laughs> to restore the foundations as the righteous, you have to start praying. I'm not talking about, oh Lord, please help us. I'm talking about taking your authority as a believer and commanding these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness to loose their hold and you rebuke, you condemn the tongues of those that are lying. You have the right to do that. Shut the mouths of senators and representatives and governors and mayors and city officials that are lying to the people. Dispatch your angels. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the corruption so that everybody will know. So the first thing that we have to do, what shall we do as the righteous? If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? First thing you have to do is pray. Take authority over these demon spirits. In 1 Timothy 2, you all know the scriptures, 1 through 4, Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, pray for all those that are in authority, kings, leaders of men. Why? He said, if you will do this, you will live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. In Arkansas, we have a born-again governor born again lieutenant governor, born again secretary of state, who used to work for us in our maintenance department. Young man that started with us and he ran for land commissioner and won and then he was so successful he ran for secretary of state. He is now secretary of state. He's filled with the Holy Ghost and speaks in other tongues. Our attorney general is spirit filled. You just go on down the line. We have constitutional officers and all six of our national representatives in Washington Senators and representatives. I see them every year. They are all born again, pro-life, pro-Israel. 
Our, our, our culture, our society is being changed by prayer, by preaching the word of God. You can do it. I know some of you think, well, Colorado is a liberal state. Well, change it. John Osteen used to give this example. He said, if you got a cat in your lap, in your petting it, and somebody comes in and says, you're rubbing the fur the wrong way. John says, well, let the cat turn around. Y'all didn't get that. <laughs> I know a lot of you are not natives of Colorado. You live in other states. One of our governors, who I have, I have all the, had all the governors on our uh, daily TV program. Mike, Mike Huckabee uh, was a great friend and taught our, our Bible school graduation uh, ceremony. And when Mike Huckabee left office in Arkansas, the state treasury had over $900 million surplus, almost a billion dollars in surplus. The next governor, uh, he went out to the governor's conference in California and um, they got together and met and, and he, he was a Christian too and, I, I, and they had about 300 million in the surplus. Arkansas has no state debt. Two thirds of all the homes in Arkansas have no mortgage. We're blessed because we have godly leaders. And I asked the governor, I said, well, did you meet with other governors? He said, oh yeah, this was when Arnold Schwarzenegger was still the governor of California. And uh, he said, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger looked me up. I said, he did. I said, what did he want? He said, he wanted to know how we uh, had $300,000 in surplus in the state treasury, uh, $300 million, and their million, hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. It's the leadership. Uh, I had a pastor tell me this. You know, all you hear about on the secular news is how liberal California is. Some of you might be from California. But this pastor told me, he said, well, we've got liberals out here. He said, but the majority of the people out here are conservative. They just don't tell anybody. Well, I'll tell you what, they better start telling it. Or we're going to lose the state. I'm not talking about to an earthquake either. I was in uh, downtown L.A. just a few years ago. Actually, we were there earlier this year, a little south L.A. Have you ever, have you been, have you driven down Tent City, all the blue tarp tents? They're now saying that they're discovering leprosy because of the, the, the filth in Tent City, the homeless. God's got a solution for everything. He just needs the right people in office. And he'll give them wisdom and knowledge as to what to do and how to do it. So what are the righteous going to do? First of all, you have to pray. You have to bind principalities, powers, rules of darkness, wicked spirits. You have to pray for all those in authority. And then you have to vote. Your vote is your faith working. Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous are in leadership, the people rejoice. Why? Because God blesses. And the next thing you can do is run for office yourself. You might think, oh, Pastor Caldwell, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't run for office. Sure you can. Run for the city board. Become a justice of the peace. Run for the school board. We had one abortion clinic left in Arkansas. And the state passed a law preparing for when the Supreme Court abolishes abortion on demand, uh, the authority is going to go back to the state. So Arkansas has been progressive in that they've already prepared legally to do away with abortion on demand. No more abortion clinics. There's only one. And they passed a law. If you have abortion clinic available, give me five more minutes. You have to have doctors that have degrees in obstetrics and gynecology. If you don't, you have to shut your doors. Well, this place 
didn't have that. They couldn't find any doctors that wanted to be associated with them. So they were going to be shut down. But a liberal judge, a lady appointed by the Obama administration, suspended the law. So the abortion clinic wouldn't have to close its doors. So people could go get an abortion. Well, you know, whatever she thought she was doing, it's, it's time limited because eventually the law will kick back in and it'll be gone. We had a lady in our congregation that ran for uh, justice of the peace. She's a single mom. She's raised two kids. In fact, her, her son and his wife were Black Hawk helicopter pilots, both of them, in Afghanistan. She raised two kids. She's born again, spirit-filled. And so she ran for justice of the peace and won. And every year she wins. And she told me, she said, Pastor, do you know what a justice of the peace does besides marry people? I said, well, I don't guess I do. She said, we determine where the money is spent. And I thought, well... I can't think of anybody that'd be better suited to decide where to spend the money than a single mother. <laughs> She's had to pinch pennies all her life and she put her son through college. I mean, she knows how to pinch, she knows how to pinch that nickel till the buffalo hollers. <laughs> so you can, you can serve Justice of the peace. You can serve on the school board. Lord knows, I don't know about Colorado, but in Arkansas, we certainly need some born again people on the school board. You know, education is not hard. It's not difficult. Well, that's all I'm gonna say about that. But you, you know, people fight and argue and they have, uh, you know, pet peeves and desires and whatever, but run for office. Our guy that worked in our maintenance department, he only had about $6,000 uh, to spend uh, to get elected land commissioner. I would see him out on the freeway at the intersections. He'd be out there holding a sign. Elect John Thurston, land commissioner. Six, six $8,000. And he won. And he did such a good job. He collected over a million dollars in back taxes on lands. And he did such a great job. They wrote an article about him in the newspaper. And all that did was fuel his campaign for Secretary of State. Now he's Secretary of State. I, uh, when I go to the state capitol, I always go by his office. And his secretary used to be my secretary. <laughs> and he asked me, and she asked me, said, can I hire her and take her to, to the state capitol with me? I need somebody that, he said, everything that he did in government, he learned working for, for our ministry. So I'll go, I'll go by his office and I go in and I'm, I knock <laughs> And the secretary, she said, oh, pastor, it's so good to see you. I said, um, is the land commissioner in? May I see the land commissioner, please? I used to call him into my office. Now I'm going into his office. So you can start anywhere. Run for dog catcher. Run for anything. Run for office. Vote and pray. And the righteous can stop the destruction of our moral foundations. Yeah. Amen. Thank y'all. Praise God. Okay, do I turn it back to, to Rick or do I dismiss? Break. Take a break. <laughs>